Welcome to Lecture 1 of Module 9, where in this module we'll be looking at two chapters. We're going to consider Chapter 12 entitled Gene Mutation with this lecture, and then we'll come back for a second lecture this module to look at Chapter 13 entitled Chromosomes. In today's chapter, we're only going to look at Chapter 12, helping set us up for some of the ideas and concepts that come with Chapter 13. In Module 7, if we go back two modules, we learned about the genetic code. And so now in this module, we'll be taking that information to identify and predict the outcome of given single base and frame shift mutations. We'll learn about that language with this lecture. We'll also consider the details of somatic and germline mutations and then consider the various ways by which mutations can be classified by phenotypic effect. We'll briefly visit expanding repeats and copy number variants, other types of mutations, before learning about the two major causes of mutations, spontaneous mutations and induced mutations. Finally, we'll take a bit of time at the end of the lecture to look at factors that influence by reducing or limiting the impact of the effect of a given mutation before we look at DNA repair systems. To begin the chapter, what are mutations? A mutation can be defined as some kind of alteration in the nucleotide sequence of an organism's genome. So that applies to us as well as other organisms. Any base pair change in any part of a DNA molecule can be considered a mutation, and it may arise from things like substitution of a base pair or base pairs, or maybe an insertion or a deletion of a base pair or pairs. Mutations may occur within regions of a gene that encode for a protein, or they may occur in non-coding regions of a gene, such as the regulatory sequence regions like promoters or enhancers. Mutations may or may not bring about any detectable change in phenotype. Because of the wide range of types and effects of mutations, geneticists classify mutations in various different ways, putting on a different hat, giving it a different label. We're going to look at a couple of these. We're going to look at classification of mutation based on the types of molecular change, based on the location of the mutation, the type of cell by which we're looking at a mutation, as well as by the phenotypic effect a mutation may cause. Let's go ahead and first look at the classification of a mutation based on molecular change. And there are two major categories. We are going to see single base substitutions, which is what this slide is about. And then as we move forward, we'll also see frame shift mutations. So let's go ahead and consider single base mutations or substitutions first, of which there are three different types of single base substitutions. We have silent, missense, and nonsense mutations. Silent mutations are what we call a point mutation. It alters a codon in the mRNA transcript. So we get to that point, we take DNA, we make a transcript. It does change the codon in the mRNA transcript, but it doesn't result in a change in the amino acid at that position in a protein once we translate. We have missense mutations. Missense mutations include a change in one nucleotide of a triplet codon with a protein coding portion of a gene that actually does result in the creation of a new triplet, just like we saw before. But this time, we're going to see that there is a different amino acid in that position of the protein once we go through translation. And then we have nonsense mutations. Nonsense mutations include a change in a nucleotide of a triplet codon, but rather than lead to a different amino acid at that position in a given protein, now we're going to see the termination of translation of the protein. So we create a stop codon. When we talk about these single base mutations, we can use two terms for the replacement of one base with another. We have the idea of transition, which is where we see a pyrimidine replacing a pyrimidine or a purine replacing a purine, but we also have transversion. So when we talk about these single base substitutions, the idea of transversion is we see a purine replaced with a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine replaced with a purine. So we see those two ideas, transition and transversion. In addition to single base mutations, our second category or classification based on molecular changes out of our frame shift mutations. But before we do that, let's actually go ahead and just look here to see how we go about, this is looking at our DNA molecule and looking at at the area by which a mutation has unfolded, moving on to our mRNA transcript and how that changes the codon, which ultimately leads to, or potentially leads to, a change in amino acid sequence. So let's go ahead and look at 
our DNA and how we would see wild type or this is just what it looks like normally. We take our TGT on our ACA and we would end up using our template to create an mRNA transcript, which we see here. If we were to look up this codon, we would see that it would code for cysteine. So that's very straightforward. This is how things naturally unfold. Now we have some mutations and we're going to see mutations in the third component or the third spot of our codon. Here we see, of course, the TG, which we see here, and AC, which we see here. But now instead of T and A, we have a C and G. And what that's going to do, that is going to change our mRNA transcript. We went from UGU to UGC. Oftentimes in the third position, the third position change doesn't change the amino acid itself. So this codon still codes for cysteine. So that's why we call this a silent mutation. I encourage you to look at the genetic code table to make sure you see how that works. Then if we look at this next scenario, we're going to see a change in our sequence of DNA such that our template strand will end up coding for yet another codon. This time, instead of UGU, now we see UGU. GG, that codon is going to be a codon for the amino acid tryptophan. So one nucleotide change is going to lead to an entirely different amino acid. We see that same thing here. We are going to see yet position three again, TG and AC are our original sequences, but then we're going to see this new modification here, which when we look at the template strand, we are going to see that our mRNA transcript is going to code for a stop codon, UGA, you go away was one of our mnemonic devices. The other two, you are annoying and you are gone. So this is going to code for a stop codon. It doesn't code for an amino acid. So ultimately we have this truncated or shortened protein when we go through the translation process. So these are the three ideas behind single base mutations when we're looking at molecular change. Looking at frame shifts, why are they called a frame shift? Ultimately, these type of mutations are frame shift mutations or described that way because the frame of triplet reading during translation is altered. A frame shift mutation occurs when any number of bases are added or deleted except multiples of three, which would reestablish the initial reading of that frame. Frame shifts outside the multiples of three, so if we insert one or we insert two or we insert four or we insert seven, etc., we see a change in the amino acid sequence down stream from the insertion or deletion point, as well as we do often see an early translation termination codon as well. So here are um, some examples of that. In this particular example, we're looking at an insertion. So we're inserting, in this case, we're just going to insert one nucleotide sequence to our existing DNA chain. And what we're going to get is because of that, this is what was our original, we're going to have to move all of these down one spot and stick in this particular nucleotide as we transcribe our DNA before we move on to translation. At the end of the day, what we're going to see is the addition here is going to bump everything else. So we see UAC, this was UAC here, now it's part of two codons, UAC. We saw GUU, now we see GUU, so now again two codons, and then AAA. AA here here, but we lose that last A because we don't actually create a new codon. So we will see two different amino acids coming in to replace what was originally supposed to be set up. Here we have an example of our deletions. So we looked at insertions. Now let's go ahead and look at deletions. Here's our wild type. Here's our original DNA that hasn't undergone any kind of frame shift mutation. Now we are going to remove a particular nucleotide sequence here, the T and the A that we see here, we're going to remove. That's going to impact everything beyond the first codon. So we are going to move Move our frame shift to our left this time rather than the right. Before we had UAC, we've ultimately taken the U out. So now we see AC, we've pulled in the G here, which falls here. Now we have a brand new codon. Before codon number two encoded for tyrosine as an amino acid, now we see that we're going to have threonine come in. Before we were looking at GUU, we had to pull that G into the second codon. Now we see UUA, A from our next codon, UUA. Before position three, 
that third codon coded for valine, now we see it coding for leucine. We had a fourth codon before, but now because we've removed or taken away a nucleotide pair, we no longer have three sequences here, so we will not have an amino acid substitute into this position. So this is the idea of the deletion. In addition to classifying mutations on the type of molecular change, that is by substitution or by frame shift, we can also group mutations based on the location of the mutation in eukaryotes. We have two primary cell types to consider. We have somatic cells and we have germline cells. So a mutation in a somatic cell versus a mutation in a germline cell. And mutations can occur in either cell type. Mutations in these cells in any cell of the body except germline is what we're looking at when we're talking about somatic cell mutation. So these are mutations that happen in any cell except germline cells. And then germline mutations only occur in germ cells. So what are germline tissues? Germline tissues are the cells that create our gametes. And remember from early in the term, these cells are located in the gonads. We have oogonia in females. We have spermatogonia in males. Now let's go ahead and consider the timing and the effects of somatic mutations, and then we will look briefly at our germline mutations. So somatic cells give rise to all non-germline tissues, and because they don't occur in cells that give rise to gametes, these mutations are not passed along to the next generation by sexual means. Sure, they're going to be passed along from cell to cell as cells in the body replicate and replace themselves, but they won't be passed along to another generation. So let's imagine a somatic mutation arising in an adult. We'll say that it's some kind of multi, let's just say it's, it's a human. So a somatic mutation, first, Will this mutation be passed along to the future generation? No, it's not going to be passed along to a future generation. And it isn't likely to result in much of a detectable phenotypic change either, unless we talk about tumors, which we don't actually get to in this chapter. In fact, the expression of most somatic mutations like this are usually masked by the expression of a wild type allele within that given cell and the presence of non-mutant cells in the remainder of the organism. Because remember, this is a mutation in a given cell, so it could be a skin cell. Well, that skin cell is only going to duplicate a certain amount to contribute toward that particular mutation, but we, it's not all of the skin cells in our body. I will say somatic mutations may be more noticeable if they occur early in development, when a small number of undifferentiated cells replicate to give rise to several differentiated tissues or organs. So somatic mutations, we say they are impacted by the timing by which the mutation arises. When we look at germline cells, mutations have the potential of being expressed in all cells of an offspring. Inherited dominant autosomal mutations will be expressed phenotypically in the first generation. In contrast, inherited recessive autosomal mutations may go unnoticed for many generations until the resultant allele has become widespread to in a given population and will be noticed only when chance meetings bring two copies of an allele together into a homozygous recessive condition. Another way by which mutations can can be classified is by phenotypic effect. And so we have this grid here taken from another genetics textbook I like to use, and it lists the various phenotypic effects that might be found. We have morphological or the visible or visual effects. We have biochemical effects, behavioral, regulatory, lethal, and conditional. Morphological effects sometimes referred to as the visible or visual effects, these effects are going to modify our outward appearance as an individual. They impact the phenotype based on physical characteristics or features. Mendel's P experiments were studies considering visible or those morphological effects. And the same can be said for other things in terms of shape, size, color, number of given structures. We have biochemical effects a mutation impacting the ability to carry out a specific biochemical pathway. In our case, the textbook talks about sickle cell anemia. So we see a mutation that impacts the ability for a biochemical pathway to proceed. We have behavioral effects, specifically some of the behavioral conditions we considered in an earlier module on behavioral genetics, like addiction and personality disorders. We have regulatory effects, where we see an alteration in gene expression. And a good example of this was E. coli, when we looked at the LAC operon in module 8 the ability to control making certain gene products given the nutrients available in the environment, either glucose or lactose. We have lethal effects, the inheritance of a given genotype not compatible with life or that causes premature death, which could occur anytime between fetal development or beyond after birth. 
And two examples we've looked at are Tay-Sachs, which is lethal around age three, and Huntington disease, which can be lethal in one's 30s and 40s or, or maybe a bit thereafter. Lastly, we have conditional effects. A phenotype expressed only when an individual is placed under certain environmental conditions. And the classic genetics example of that, and it's, it's not a human example, but the classic genetic example is temperature sensitive pigmentation. We see that with Siamese cats. We see that with Arctic hares. Siamese cats have temperature sensitive fur color, and it really has to do with an enzyme that's produced or not produced given a particular temperature. Their fur appears unpigmented or light colored when grown in warm temperature environments whereas it appears pigmented and dark in cooler temperatures. And so these cats, their ears are a bit cooler, their tail is a bit cooler. And so the coloring changes based on that particular environmental condition. We've, we've really looked at the three ways by which we can classify mutations, but there are some other things to consider. So some other types of mutations that you'll come upon in your reading of the textbook as well as in the medical field. Expanded repeats is one you will see. So let's look at something a little different, this idea of a trinucleotide repeat or an expanded repeat. That is mutations that occur when the number of triplets present in a mutated gene is greater than that number found in a normal gene. And so trinucleotide repeats are responsible for a handful of repeat expansion diseases. There are about 20 of them in total, commonly with an underlying neurodegenerative or neuromuscular symptom framework. In this lecture, I want to cover three trinucleotide diseases, Huntington disease, fragile X syndrome, and myotonic dystrophy, three commonly found diseases in clinical practice. Okay, so what are these trinucleotide repeats? Trinucleotide repeats are heritable disorders caused by a sequence of DNA nucleotides in groups of three, such as CAG, CGG, CTG repeated a certain number of times in a row. These repeats can be found in coding or non-coding sequences of genes, and it's when the size of the triplet repeat exceeds a disease threshold, which is specific for each gene and disorder. The expanded repeats will affect gene function, leading to a specific clinical disease phenotype. To understand the manifestation of trinucleotide repeats, I want to refer you to a brief clip on YouTube, an animation of DNA replication, if you will, to give you an idea of how these trinucleotide repeats can quickly develop to a critical level from one generation to the next through the process of simple replication. So imagine this yellow portion is the portion where the trinucleotide repeat is. And as you know, helicases open the DNA and DNA polymerases copy it. So we're going to watch the repeat now, get through the helicase, this single strand is it shown. The DNA polymerase slips on that repeat and a hairpin is formed. And as this now go through, you will watch as we'll, as we'll go through the second cycle, next round of replication. This longer repeat will now get replicated and incorporated in our DNA. And you're going to end up with an expansion. And here you've seen a small expansion, but imagine this going on again and again and again. So with time, this will continue to get bigger and that's why the disease will keep getting worse. Watching this video, I hope you can better understand the instability of the trinucleotide region with an expansion of the sequence as it's passed from one generation to the next. And with this in mind, I want you to visualize how these trinucleotide repeats can ultimately go on to impact the function of a protein. Can you visualize the additional amino acids, all the same amino acid, that must be added to a protein by reading an mRNA transcript that's been transcribed from a segment of DNA that includes all of these repeats? Were you able to understand the ramifications of that hairpin structure within the trinucleotide repeat on gene function, how the hairpin development in one round of replication led to a significant issue with added repeats in the next round of DNA replication? There are several human diseases I mentioned, about 20, caused by this unusual form of mutation called the trinucleotide repeat expansion. I will discuss three, Huntington fragile and myotonic dystrophy, as you see here. In Huntington disease, it's an autosomal dominant disease, the trinucleotide 
sequence is CAG, and we see that right here, CAG. And it's repeated in the coding region of a gene, specifically within the first exon. And if you don't remember those details, go back to last module to review some of that terminology. Symptomatically, the disease is a neurodegenerative disorder with phenotype characterized by the sudden, unintended, uncontrollable jerky movements of arms, legs, facial muscles. We see dysotonia, involuntary muscle contraction that causes uncontrolled shaking and blinking. We see incoordination, cognitive decline, behavioral difficulties. According to the website we've looked at with one of our genetics projects, the OMIM website, in normal individuals, the range of trinucleotide repeats, how many repeats of CAG there are, somewhere between 9 and 36 for normal individuals, healthy individuals. A critical repeat size is about 37 or beyond, and the symptoms arise within that 37 number and beyond. CAG ultimately codes for glutamine, so the proteins associated with its gene have what we call polyglutamine nature, which is that polyglutamine, those, those multiple glutamine amino acids are thought to alter the function of the protein Huntington. And so Huntington protein is found in the mitochondria, the microtubules, transport vesicles of cells, and synaptic vesicles. We also have fragile X syndrome. Now this is associated with chromosome X and it's associated with a gene called the FMR1 gene. In Fragile X, the trinucleotide sequence is CGG, and it's repeated in the five prime untranslated region of this particular gene, adjacent to the coding sequence for the gene. It's thought because of abnormal methylation, so the CH3 groups are being added. This suppresses transcription of the FMR1 gene, leading to decreased protein levels in the brain, and that protein that would traditionally be transcribed and translated plays a critical role in the development and connection of synapses between nerve cells to help with cell-to-cell -cell communication. Fragile X accounts for about half of cases of X-linked impaired intellectual development, and it's the second most common cause of mental impairment after trisomy 21, or Down syndrome. Symptoms include moderate to severely impaired intellectual development, distinct facial features, a long face, large ears, very prominent jaw. And we're going to see in terms of repeats, normal is somewhere between 5 and 44. We have a, a risky range between 55 and 200 here. There's actually a, a slight area here by which we are still somewhat normal before we get to this risky phase. You might be wondering why there is a branch or a break between 44 and 55, but ultimately under 55 is normal. Hitting that 55 to 200 mark, we have some characteristics and certainly a risk, and then greater than 200 is a full mutation. Lastly, we have myotonic dystrophy type 1, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. In myotonic dystrophy, again, type 1, because there is a type 2, which is an entirely different disorder in terms of characteristics, the trinucleotide sequence is CTG, and it's found repeated in the 3' prime untranslated region, found downstream of the coding region for dystrophia myotonica protein kinase gene, DM PK gene. Patients with myotonic dystrophy are characterized by myotonia or the, the delayed relaxation of skeletal muscles after voluntary contraction, muscular dystrophy with a progressive weakness or loss of muscle mass, cataracts, hypogonadism, which is little production of sex hormones or lower production of sex hormones, as well as some ECG changes, so heart changes in terms of conduction of the heart. In terms of the number of repeats, under 37 of these CTG repeats is normal. We see a premutation around that 50 to 80 up to 150. Patients with classic myotonic dystrophy have somewhere around 150 up to a thousand repeats with a full mutation. And so as we discuss the trinucleotide repeat, I want to introduce the idea of anticipation to you. Make sure you understand anticipation. As a triplet repeat expands from replication to replication, the severity of the disease tends to worsen in future generations and the age of onset decreases. This is the concept of anticipation. So anticipation, the severity of the disease worsens with the next generation and the age of onset of symptoms decreases. Now, sometimes the severity 
severity of the trinucleotide repeat disease depends on whether it's inherited from a father or mother. In Huntington disease, we will see the trinucleotide repeat is more likely to occur if inherited from the father. A myotonic muscular dystrophy, the disease is more likely to occur if inherited from the mother. So to conclude these ideas about expanded repeats, be sure you understand how the repeat can expand, as we saw during the that process of DNA replication in the video clip, and that it's associated with that idea of a hairpin expansion. We hopped right over a certain concept when we looked at chapter seven, our chapter seven module, but now we're going to introduce the idea of copy number variants. So this was something that was very briefly mentioned in chapter seven. Copy number variants are structural differences in DNA sequences within a chromosome, specifically the number of copies of a particular DNA sequence. Variants can be short or they may be involved in thousands of bases making up a sequence. When individual genomes are compared, so we look at genomes side by side, the number of copies of any given duplicated sequence within a given gene is found to differ. Sometimes there's a large number of copies, sometimes there are smaller number of copies. These copies may lie next to one another on a chromosome. We call that idea tandem copies, or they might be located far away from one another on a given chromosome, or maybe even located on a different chromosome altogether. The ability to sequence our genome, which came about as a result of the Human Genome Project that concluded in 2003, allows us to visualize copy number variants by looking at duplications of genetic material and coding as well as in non-coding regions of the genome. Some copy number variants have no effect on a given phenotype. Others can cause a direct effect by inserting themselves into protein coding genes that offset a reading frame. There is an accumulation of evidence that copy number variants are thought to be involved in some neurodevelopmental disorders like autism or being on the autism spectrum disorder, hyperactivity disorders like ADHD, Copy number variants have been strongly implicated in the genetic etiology of schizophrenia. Further, if we look at trisomy, the duplication of an entire chromosome, like chromosome 18 with Edwards syndrome, chromosome 21 Down syndrome, we could argue that this is a copy number variant. Certainly large, to be sure, but a copy number variant of all of the DNA sequences found on one given chromosome. I'd like to switch gears now and look at causes of mutation. So we've looked at mutations, generally the different ways we may categorize them. Let's go ahead and look at the causes of mutations. And there are two different types of mutations. They can be classified in two ways, either as spontaneous or as induced. And let's go ahead and look at spontaneous first. Spontaneous mutations are changes in the nucleotide sequence of genes that appears to occur naturally. That is no specific agent, no chemical agent, no physical agent is associated with their occurrence. Many of these mutations result or arise as a result of normal biological chemical processes altering the structure of our nucleotide sequence. We're going to cover three processes that lead to spontaneous mutations. We're going to look at DNA replication errors and an idea we call slippage. We're going to look at tautomeric shifts and we'll look at oxidative damage. So first up in our study of causes of mutations are DNA replication errors and slippage. As we learned in an earlier module, the process of DNA replication is imperfect at best. Occasionally, DNA polymerase inserts the incorrect nucleotide during replication of a strand of DNA. And although DNA polymerase can certainly act as a quality check, correcting some of those errors, misincorporated nucleotides may persist even after replication. If these errors aren't detected and corrected, they can lead to mutation. So in addition to mispairing leading to single base mutations, we might see small insertions or deletions, which occur when one strand of the DNA template maybe loops out and becomes displaced during replication, or when DNA polymerase slips or stutters during replication, something we call replication slippage. In such a manner, where there's a loop, DNA polymerase may miss the looped out nucleotides, and a small deletion in the new strand is going to be introduced. Loops are certainly common in certain regions of DNA, especially in regions where there are repeated sequences, the hot spots of DNA mutation. And sometimes a contribution to hereditary diseases like Fragile X syndrome and Huntington disease are going to arise as a result of this. We also have tautomeric shifts. Tautomeric shifts, when we look at those, purines and pyrimidines can exist in tautomeric forms, that is in alternate chemical forms that differ by shift to some of our protons. Without taking too much time to discuss the details of it, suffice it to say that changes in the covalent structure of a given molecule, like a purine or pyrimidine, may lead to base pair changes 
So if we take one of the more uncommon chemical alternatives, we might see that adenine pairs with guanine or thymine pairs with cytosine instead of our traditional ATGC pairings. A mutation then occurs during DNA replication when in the next round of replication, those mismatched members of a base pair and a strand are separated and each becomes the template for the normal complementary base. And this is where we see mutation arise, typically point mutation. We also have oxidative damage. So this is a third type of spontaneous mutation. DNA may suffer from the byproducts of normal cellular respiration, normal cellular processes, including reactive oxygen species generated during aerobic respiration. For instance, we might see superoxides or hydroxyl radicals or hydrogen peroxide created during cell metabolism that become a threat to the overall integrity of DNA risking modifications to bases or loss of bases, single strand breaks. So this is a third type of very spontaneous mutation. We also have a list of induced mutations. In contrast to our spontaneous mutations, these induced mutations may be the result of either natural agents or exposures like UV light, or they may be human-made or man-made additions, such as industrial pollutants or other chemicals like tobacco smoke. So we have base or nucleotide analogs, we have alkylating agents, intercalating agents, and then we have our ultraviolet light and ionizing radiation. The first class of mutagenic chemicals consists of base analogs. These are chemical compounds with a structure that's similar to any of our four nitrogenous bases of DNA. DNA polymerase really can't tell the difference or distinguish the analogs from standard bases. So if base analogs are present during DNA replication, they might be incorporated into newly synthesized DNA by substituting for the traditional purine or pyrimidine. Our textbook gives an example. We have 5-bromouracil, a derivative of uracil, and it's an analog to and behaves like thymine. It has the same structure as thymine, except that there's a bromine atom on the 5-carbon position instead of a methyl group. And so we see that here. We're going to see the bromine, but we see our methyl here in the 5-position. Normally, 5 bromouracil pairs with adenine, just as thymine does but occasionally it mispairs with guanine. And this ultimately leads to issues in the next round of DNA replication. And in addition, the presence of bromine increases sensitivity of DNA molecules to UV light, which in itself is mutagenic. Further bromine can, further bromine in place of methyl increases the probability that a tautomeric shift might ultimately occur. We have alkylating agents. Alkylating agents are chemicals that don't need an alkyl group like CH3, which is methyl, or ethyl, which is CH2CH3, to amino groups in nucleotides. So we're adding a, a, either a CH3 or a CH2CH3 to an amino group in our nucleotides. As with base analogs, additions of alkyl groups skew or alter base pairing due to nucleotide substitutions and mutations may result. Intercalating agents are chemical substances with similar shape and dimension as a purine pyrimidine pair. And that is going to allow them to potentially wedge or sandwich themselves between the base pairs of DNA, which distorts the three-dimensional structure of our DNA helix. And it can cause single nucleotide insertions and deletions and replication. These distortions of the DNA structure may affect DNA replication as well as the process of transcription. And deletions and insertions may ultimately occur, leading to frame shift mutations. Now our last two, we're talking about UV light and ionizing radiation. UV light, I mean, it's certainly not as energetic as ionizing radiation, but UV light is highly mutagenic. Purines like adenine and guanine and pyrimidines like thymine and cytosine absorb UV light, which causes chemical bonds to form between adjacent pyrimidine molecules on the same strand of DNA, creating, especially when we're talking about thymine, create these thymine dimers. And we see that here. If we have two thymines right next to each other. That exposure to UV light will lend to the idea that two thymines will create a thymine dimer by which the thymine nucleotides sitting next to one another covalently bond and create this bulky lesion that distorts DNA and can certainly inhibit normal replication and transcription. We also have 
ionizing radiation, x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays. These are forms of ionizing radiation that are certainly more energetic than our UV radiation, where they have the ability to penetrate tissues, causing ionization of the molecules that are encountered along the way. That is the idea that electrons can be dislodged from the atoms they encounter, which changes the stability of molecules by modifying them into free radicals and reactive ions. And when that happens, then we see this alteration of structure on bases. We might see phosphodiester bonds break within DNA. Ionizing radiation also frequently results in double-stranded breaks, and this damage can be lethal for a cell. Although it's not assumed that radiation comes from artificial sources, such as nuclear power plants, medical wastes, medical devices, scientific studies, I just want to point out to you that scientific studies show that m the most significant sources of human radiation exposure is actually naturally found. We might see it as radon gases, as cosmic rays, as radioactivity in the soil. So although we, our mind immediately goes to a nuclear power plant or nuclear waste, we do actually see radiation coming from more natural sources than that. Our textbook gives a few ideas about factors that lessen the effects of mutations. And so we will go through these next. First of all, we have the idea of degeneracy. Because a codon is a triplet, any combination of four nucleotides, we actually see that there are 64 total codons. So there are four different nucleotides. We need to pick three of those in order to make a codon. There actually ends up giving us the opportunity, four to the third power gives us 64 different possible codons. And then we have some stop codons giving us a total of 61 different opportunities to create 20 amino acids. And so we see that here. This means that more than one codon can code for a specific amino acid. And we call this idea redundancy. So re think of that word, redundancy. And with this in mind, generally a mutation in the third position of a codon is called silent. As for many of the codons, it's the first two nucleotides that lend to a given amino acid. And so take a look at this here. When we look at uh, these different amino acid codons, we're going to see that the first two tend to be repeated, but it's that third one that ends up being different. So we look at serine here. We see four codons here for serine just in this box alone, UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG. They all share that UC. So if we were looking at a codon where the third nucleotide has been altered, it may not make a difference. We may have a silent mutation there. And so that's the idea of redundancy. And then we say that the genetic code is degenerate. As we look at codons, mutations in the second position of a codon often result in the replacement of one amino acid for another, but that replacement, we might see sharing of some of the same characteristics between one amino acid and the next. For instance, if we look at serine and threonine, so we're going to look at those, we're going to see that we have AGU and AGC for serine, but we have ACU and ACC for threonine. They're both two polar or hydrophilic amino acids, as you see down here. With the only difference between them, a hydrogen atom extends with serine, and then we see that the methyl group is going to extend for threonine. So those two end up being very similar and behaving very similar. The textbook also gives the example of alanine with GCC and glycine with GGC. And these have a similar conformation, even if their tendencies are different. Alanine is hydrophobic, glycine is hydrophilic. And so we see that here. The next thing our textbook talks about is conditional mutations. And I don't actually have a separate slide for conditional mutations. However, conditional mutations are defined as mutations that have a wild type phenotype under certain permissive environmental conditions, and then a mutant phenotype under more restrictive or, or altered conditions. So we have this idea of being permissive or restrictive. The textbook uses the enzyme deficiency called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency as their example, under certain restrictive conditions, specifically that an individual is eating fava beans, 
So they have this enzyme deficiency. They're eating fava beans. Individuals express a mutant phenotype in that they risk developing something called hemolytic anemia if they are deficient of that enzyme and they are consuming fava beans. Now, if they don't have fava beans and they don't undergo some a uh, couple of different kind of medical treatments, they will not experience any phenotypic symptoms. So living a fava bean free lifestyle, the permissive lifestyle, that G6PD disorder isn't of concern. So we have the idea again, conditional mutations where we see something permissive versus restrictive. Lastly, when we consider DNA replication as it pertains to our stem cells, when stem cells are recruited to create some kind of differentiated cell, they divide to yield another stem cell and a differentiated cell. And so this is the idea of a stem cell beginning the process to replicate in order to create a new stem cell as well as some kind of differentiated cell or what will become a differentiated cell. As they do this, as this process occurs, the oldest strands of DNA are going to segregate to stay with the stem cell. And so we see that here. We're going to see that these two strands would separate. We create a new complementary strand in red here, and we take red and we create a new complementary strand here. This is going to move on to our differentiated cell, our future differentiated cell. But this brown strand here is going to continue remaining a stem cell. So we keep the oldest strands of DNA. We segregate those. We keep those with the stem cell. The most recently replicated DNA strand goes on to the more specialized daughter cells. And in this manner, mutations are kept away from stem cells that must continually undergo regeneration. I'd like to now go ahead and move on to our last topic of the chapter. And this is the idea of DNA repair systems. How do we repair when things do go wrong? What kind of systems are available to us? Living systems have evolved elaborate repair systems to counteract the spontaneous as well as induced damages we see in DNA. And our textbook discusses two major concepts. One's called excision repair and the other is mismatch repair. I've actually added a third equally important method of DNA repair, which you need to know for your final exam. So first of all, we're going to look at excision repair and we're going to look at two types of excision repair, nucleotide excision repair and base repair excision repair. And think about those two terms. What is a nucleotide versus what is the base? And we see that bases make up nucleotides. Remember, we have three components that make up a nucleotide, including a base. So we have two different types of repair under excision repair based on whether or not we need to pull out an entire nucleotide or just replace a base. So nucleotide excision repair. In this method of repair, we're going to be removing an entire stretch of nucleotides often as a result of UV damage that causes maybe thymine dimers. In this manner, we're going to see helicase come in and unwind the double-stranded DNA. And then we're going to have another enzyme come in, an endonuclease, that's going to remove a stretch of nucleotides, which include the thymine dimer. Once that's done, DNA polymerase moves in, uses the remaining strand as the template to lay down new nucleotides that we've just pulled out, and then DNA ligase comes in to seal up the gap. And so what we've done here, we've just removed a lesion, maybe a loop caused by UV light damage, and this removes entire nucleotides from one of the strands. And so we see that right here. We will see some kind of damaged nucleotide. We are going to rely on enzymes to open up our double strand of DNA. We're going to see an endonuclease come in and cut that out. And so we see that here. We might see this as well as a few nucleotides on the other side. Now we need to go ahead and pair up with complementary nucleotides. We will rely on DNA polymerase for that. Then we will use DNA ligase to seal things up. So that is nucleotide excision repair. Now we look at base pair excision. We're looking at the removal of bases, not the entire nucleotides, generally just bases that have been damaged or have some kind of chemical modification. And to do so, we're going to rely on DNA glycosylase. And that enzyme is responsible for breaking the glycosidic link a bond between a base and the sugar backbone. So we're going to see that happen first. We identify a damaged base. Remember, these were damaged nucleotides. Now we're just looking at the base. So we want to cut that base out, but we leave the rest of the nucleotide in place. So we use that DNA glycosylase. Then we're going to look for an endonuclease to come in, and we're going to have that endonuclease go ahead and nick that sugar phosphate backbone. We're going to remove the rest of the nucleotide, and then we'll rely on DNA polymerase to come in, 
and fill it with a new nucleotide, and then again, DNA ligase comes in and seals the gap. So those two are, are somewhat similar, and make sure you recognize the small nuances between the two with regard to excision repair. We'll also look at mismatch repair, a little different than excision repair, where we're focused on base or nucleotide repair. Mismatch repair fixes errors missed by the proofreading capabilities of DNA polymerase. We're going to see a special protein that binds to the site of the mismatched base, directing an endonuclease to cut or nick that sugar phosphate backbone, another enzyme. Now we're going to see an exonuclease come in that degrades a short region of the DNA strand. And then we're going to see the elimination of that misincorporated nucleotide and then DNA polymerase will come in, fill the gap with a new nucleotide using the correct DNA strand as a template. And then again, Again, DNA ligase comes in and seals the gap. And you might wonder how our cell machinery knows what strand to remove. How does our cell machinery know which is the incorrect component? Soon after a DNA strand is synthesized, an enzyme adds methyl groups to certain bases. Because this takes a little time, it's assumed that a new strand is still unmethylated immediately after it's synthesized. Therefore, the template strand is methylated, the new strand is not. That's going to allow repair enzymes to distinguish between the intentional nucleotide and the nucleotide error that's been made. Once the incorrect nucleotide is removed, DNA polymerase sets down a new nucleotide, DNA ligase comes in and closes up the gap. So we see all of that unfold. Our last repair system, and this is something our textbook doesn't discuss, but I do want you to know about, double-stranded break repair system. So thus far, we've discussed repair pathways that address damage of errors within a strand of DNA. But we'll conclude this lecture with a discussion of DNA repair by considering one example of what happens when both strands of double-stranded helix are cleaved. Maybe they're broke. Maybe it's ionizing radiation that has ended up leading to a double-stranded break. We need to rejoin the two severed strands. And this is, I'm just going to talk about this somewhat generically. We need to rejoin those two strands. And in doing so, we need some kind of homologous DNA because we need a template. But how do we get a template? We don't have it in our damaged strand, and the other strand is damaged as well. But remember, we have another copy of our genes. We have sister chromatids, and we might be able to rely on them, those sister chromatids, for a missing sequence we need. We, first of all, are going to use an exonuclease. We're going to trim up some of these ends of our breaks, so make them clean. And next, we're going to find the homologous region of homologous DNA, on a sister chromatid. We're going to identify the nucleotides that need to replace the digested section of DNA that we've just digested with exonuclease. And then through some very fancy footwork, which is outside the scope of this class, and the help of a protein we call RAD51, that broken strand is going to interact with the double-stranded DNA sequence from the sister chromatid. DNA polymerase coordinates the synthesis of new nucleotides from our three prime overhang. And then we're going to, again, use DNA ligase to seal the strands back together. And the structure yields two DNA segments with no breaks and very hopefully the same sequence that we had or a very similar sequence to what we had before that break happened. So we have three repair systems. Again, going back, we have our excision repair, we have mismatch repair, and this idea of the double-stranded break. And see how DNA polymerase continues to support, DNA ligase continues to support, just as if we were making or replicating DNA from the very first time. Now this is going to conclude our chapter 12, and we'll come back for a second lecture this module with chapter 13. If you have questions, please reach out to me. We can schedule a time to meet and discuss the concerns you have. Otherwise, in the meantime, Make it a great day.